for um, listening to my explanations or my answers. All right. A group of closely related organisms capable of interbreeding to produce the fertile offspring are known as members of a species. Right. The reason why, and this will actually end up forming a population, yes, like, so because they can interbreed within themselves, makes them a species, really, all right? That's, if you meant to define what population is, you meant to say the fact that they are the same species that can interbreed within themselves, like what you have here, these are octopuses, these are seahorses, these are, these are sharks, these are crabs. So this forms a species. So these are this form a population of the same species to reproduce to so give us the same members of the same species, so to say. A beaker of pond water containing few specimens of Euglena was placed in a dark room for two weeks. At the end of this period, the specimens of Euglena were still alive because they were now you have to but I will employ you to read these questions again if that first reading wasn't clear enough. Now, the point is keeping a Euglena in the dark means that you have prevented it from photosynthesizing. It can actually photosynthesize because it has what we call chloroplasts. It has chloroplasts there. Now, but when you've kept it in the dark, it's meant to, um, that means it's not going to be able to anymore, which means it's going to end up dying. That's what is expected. But it says, it says it's still alive. Why is it in news that it's still alive? Because we felt that since it's not photosynthesizing, it should die. However, you can not want to die because it can also feed as an animal. It can, it has something here called Pellicle is not shown here. It's meant to be the out. Okay, I saw it here. That's pellicle with which you can actually use to um, hold on to small microscopic organisms in the water there. So it can actually feed holozoically, which means it can it can um, feed like an animal, so to say. All right. So in fact, I think in one of the other years, I talked about the fact that Euglena has animal characteristics and plant characteristics so it's two in one organism so if there's darkness you cannot photosynthesize it falls back to ability to um feed using animal features so to say i'm going to do that using the pellicle to like engulf the prey as the case may be the cytoplasm of a cell is considered a very important component because Regulate the amount of energy, you know, suspends all celled organelles, suspends. Okay, yes, it contains all cell organelles. Okay, so that's the answer there. All cell organelles are found within the cytoplasm. So this is the cytoplasm here, all this whole space. That's all those spaces there. So you can see mitochondrion there, and the plasma reticulum. Uh, Okay, let's say this chloroplast. Let me say it doesn't really look like a plant cell, anyways. But so this is the nucleus. So this should be ribosomes. Okay, so those small, small dots are ribosomes. So the point is, this cytoplasm contains what we call cell organelles, or some books we call them subcellular structures. It means the same thing. Now, this is a tissue funnel that is that has distilled water in it. And, um, sorry, that has sugar solution in it. And um, in, it's now surrounded by um, water. So you can see a membrane tied over the funnel. Now, use the diagram to answer the question. After and how? The level of water in the teeth to funnel wheel. Now we need to understand some few things quickly here. 
Okay, so we have the still water surrounding the tissue funnel, and we have our sugar solution inside the tissue funnel, and this is separated with this membrane there. So normally osmosis is um this is what is at this experiment is tested for osmosis, which is gonna be that water is meant to um move from this surrounding into the tissue funnel. So we will expect that the level of solution, which is sugar solution within the tissue funnel, should rise. So the answer is A. However, it says after and how. So it's going to be little. What that's not shown here is going to be quite little. The, 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 the rise will not be that much. All right. But after like 24 hours or like how it's meant to have risen to some extent, then the time comes by it comes um, when the movement has, I mean, the, the water has diluted the solution so much the water then wouldn't move and I mean the the, the 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 increase will stop because once water keeps going in to dilute the sugar solution a time comes whereby the osmotic pressure within sugar solution becomes lower so it won't suck in more water any longer so this is what I was trying to explain the concept is the fact that when you have two membranes the one that has lower or weaker parts will send its water molecules alone that's why we call this semi-permeable so they allow the water to pass this is semi-permeable so you can see the water solution moving there to dilute the salt which is the solute at the other side there and this is uh, what i mean you can pause the video here to make this um for you to understand this the most you can see this like semi-permeable membrane separating there's the water this is the sugar. How do I know that? Because it was the what the, the sugar part that rose. All right. So that explains the fact that water must have moved to that part. That's why the volume there increased. Now I use the diagram shown to answer the question. The experiment above is used to demonstrate apparently osmosis. Osmosis. Okay, use the diagram to answer the question. In plants, the role of the membrane is played by the... Oh, okay. So in plants, it's going to be played by cell... Excuse me. Yeah, of course, the cell wall... Sorry. Mm. <laughs> Trying to get something there. Because. Yes, cell wall. Cell wall, please. Cell wall. If cell membrane were to be there, maybe I would have picked cell membrane. But cell wall is correct. <laughs> that selectively per permits what goes in and out. All right. Red blood cells were found to have burst upon, sorry, open, burst open after being placed in a distilled water for an hour. This phenomenon is known as, of course, when you put um, a cell in a water or in a solution that is less concentrated than itself, what happens is, it exhibits what we call endosmosis. It keeps sucking in water till, if you don't bring it out of that cell, it end up bursting. And in that case, we call it hemolysis for red blood cells, please. We are using the word hemolysis here because the water keeps coming in. So this is the case here. This is when you put the red blood cell in an hypotonic. When we say hypotonic, it means a solution, sorry, means a solution that is diluted. So it keeps sucking in the water. It time comes when it becomes turgid, it's hard. And if you don't bring it out, it's gonna you know, rupture. So because it is rupture, you call it lysis or lysis, but, but the cell that is rupturing now is called, it's a blood cell. So that's why we call it hemolysis. Hemolysis, this is very 
very important. So you can also see it here that, um, but for plant cell, plant cell won't rupture because of the presence of cell wall, which is rigid, all right? This is very important. It's, so you can actually possibly get to see what happens. This is a concentrated solution. This is dilute solution. This one means isotonic means is the same um, concentration with the cell it is surrounding. So water goes in and out, no swelling, no shrinkage. This one is going to shrink because the water surrounding it, sorry, the address is water, the fluid or solution surrounding it is quite strong. So it's going to suck out the water, all of the water specifically from the cell. All right. And that will lead to shrinkage, which we call crenation in animal cell. And we call it plasmolysis in um, plant cell. And you can see it here that this entire wall did not shrink because it is um, um, rigid. Like I told you, the cell wall is rigid, so it doesn't give way to shrinkage in any way. Now, the curvature movement of plant in response to stimuli of water water as to its um, hydro and tropism means directional movement so that's, that's going to be hydrotropism which can be represented this way so this hydrotropism so the water the only wa water around here is here so the the solution the, the, the route moves towards that to get water basically sorry i'm getting bringing that out all right so now let me also explain some other things here. This is geotropism, which means response of roots towards gravity. All right. They actually, there's a hormone called auxin that helps that plays a role in geotropism and phototropism, really. But um, we'll do all of that now so that we'll be able to answer our question very well. So, and this is stigmotropism, which means um in case we are by an uh the, the 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 twig or let me say the the yeah the 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 the, the tender part of a plant it's not all plants anyways wraps around a torch or let me say mechanical obstruction so to say you must have seen this before so it's going to wrap around that that way that's this that one is called thigmo this is thigmotropism this is geotropism and this is Hydrotropism basically. For the tropism is not here. This is okay, this is it, anyways. The shoot is moving towards the light. And that's one, two. And uh, we call this, we say this is um positive phototropism. It's moving towards light, and we say it's negative geotropism because it's moving away from the earth's surface. All right. Of course, if I've thought if you've seen my lecture on responses, we say that. When an organism is moving towards the stimulus, we say it is positive. When it's moving away from it, it's called negative, all right? The overall equation or reaction in glycolysis can be summarized as what? Well, this is, um, all these represent glucose and um, all these represents pyruvic acid or pyruvate. So, from what we have here, the balanced equation here will be option. At the end of glycolysis, we've produced two ATPs. So the balanced equation here is going to be B. This one. All right. Yes. That's the, yes. Option B is correct. This is pyruvate. And you produce two ATPs there. Bear in mind that in glycolysis, actually, let me go back there. In glycolysis, you actually produce four ATPs. Actually, net ATP is, I mean, oh no, a gross ATP is four. But why do we have two as net? Because while you, while while in the process, two ATPs will be used. That sounds funny. Yes. It's like you're, make, you, you're using energy while you're creating energy, yes. So the, the two you use while creating energy must be subtracted from the four ATPs you form at the end of the day. So that gives you two ATP as a net ATP.
The longest bone in the human body or in the body will be the femur. And equally one of the strongest, if not the strongest bone anyways, in the human body. Yes, this is the femur. This is what it looks like. Femur and humerus used to look alike. Wow, I wish I had added that picture. I just remember now. But um, one thing you, sh you should remember is that one of the ways you can re know the difference between femur in diagrams, basically, is because it has a longer neck like that. Because this will fit into a hole called acetabulum in the okay the, in the pubic bone like that in the pelvic girdle, but for humerus this neck is quite short, almost not noticeable. It's there, but it's not as long and obvious as this one is. Now, which of the following structure is not a skeletal material, which means it's not used, it's not in any of the skeletal material? Well. Chitin is used in arthropods as a skeletal materials, which is what you're having here, this chitin. Of course, it can be added with other kind of um, minerals like calcium, so become calcified to make it very hard. But chitin is one major skeletal material in arthropods. Then cartilages and bones, of course, you can see that here in mammals, and let's encode it. Not all of them anyways, but I think most codes have either cartilages and bones or cartilages in no loan. So the answer that is that's not, I mean the, the, the option here that's not a skeletal material will be your muscles. Alright. So while other ones are examples of skeletal materials, the reason why the flow of blood through the capillary is very low is okay. Because the cell, the walls of capillary are thick. Okay. The yes, answer is D. There are large number and there are large numbers, and one cell thick wall enables them to provide large surface area through which uh, materials can be exchanged between the blood. So when blood is flowing through them, it doesn't have to go very fast so that there can be enough time for gaseous exchange. Imagine the, that blood just flows through this very fast. If it's too fast, then there will be enough time for exchange of nutrients, of gases. So you can see oxygen, amino acid, glucose is going out of the cell. So out of the blood into the cell, let's say into the cell like that. While from the cell, you have carbon dioxide and waste going into the blood that way. You can see that even water is going into the blood, into the capillary. So this is the capillary anyways, just an illustration. But if it is too fast, it won't, there won't be enough time for this to take place. All right. Which of the following groups of organism has kidney as the excretory organ and that will be fishes and um, amphibians are man yes majorly codates yes all of those ones are codates other ones have other examples other than codates there so a is correct which of the following features is not a characteristic of arteries so Arteries possesses valve at inter at intervals throughout their length. I mean, this is meant to be. I think this should be intervals throughout their length, and that is wrong because it's only veins that have that. But let's see what that has to say. Have thick muscular wall and elastic wall. That's correct. Carry blood away from the heart without exception. That's correct. Transport sensitive blood with exception of the primary artery. That is correct. So. The answer is A there. It's only veins that have valves. So you can pause the video here to see what I just talked about. This is valves in the vein. The wall are thinner. And um, of course, for artery, you can see the, the, the wall. Sorry, the, the, the wall is quite thicker there. You can see the thickness. And, and the lumen is quite, this lumen here is quite, um, smaller compared to that of the vein. Vein has a thinner wall with a bigger lumen, while artery has a thicker wall 
with a narrower lumen. That's why um, you develop pressure majorly in the artery. Now, it says here the graph below shows the result of a laboratory investigation which measured the body temperature of a lizard and a bird under changing artificial condition, which means it was humans that changed that. Now, use it to answer the question which of the following statements below is valid? Okay, the bird's blood was always warmer than that of the lizard. Okay. Okay, let me see this. This is the 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 bird. The bird remained quite the same all the way. Okay, while that of the lizard increased that way. Now the body of the the body temperature of the blood of the bird very less than that of the lizard during the changes of in time environments. Okay. The body temperature of the bird remained constant despite the change in the environment in the environmental temperature, the, the body temperature of the lizard was always close to that of the environmental temperature. Not quite. The answer is D. So it's C. Which means that it only is if you look at that what, what happens to the body of the, the the temperature of the bird, it's almost the same. It just varied a little. But that of the um, so even with the increase in temperature, can you see temperature is going this way? 60, 80, 100, 120. And the temperature, the body temperature is not that much in the bird. You can say it is. Well, for um, lizard, it went that way, rose up, went that way, like that, like that. So that's why birds and mammals are called warm-blooded or homeothermic animals, or we can call them endotherms, so to say. Their body temperature is regulated fairly constantly, regardless of the changes in the environment. So that's the reason why the answer here is um, um, C. Okay, what physiological term can be used to describe regulation of the body temperature of the lizard which are cold-blooded i didn't mention that they are cold-blooded we are warm-blooded and warm-blooded animals are called homeothermic cold are called hyokilothermic so from what you have here c is the answer it's because it's referring to the lizard which are cold-blooded which their temperature varies with the environment all right we can see that explicitly from the diagram that out from that graph the reason why hospitals use normal saline solution as drip instead of water is what? This is some normal saline. I want you to take note of something. That's not really shown here, but it has a lot of things in it. It has sodium chloride, 0.9%. It has sodium, I mean, things like that. Now, you might ask me why. The reason is because to prevent sorry to maintain the composition of body fluid now if you just put ordinary water into the body this what happens is going to end up diluting the body fluid but what is here normal saline is like the same amount of minerals in body fluid even when you're going to take um, what's it called? ORS. The ORS you're taking is not ordinary water also. It's a water that contains some salt in it so that it won't just add water. If you add ordinary water into your like that, it's going to like end up diluting the body fluid, which is not what we want. So the answer is to maintain the composition of body fluid. All right. The part of the ear which contains nerve cells sensitive to sound vibration is the okay that would be the cochlea please that's part of the internal ear this part here this is of course you can see this is outer here middle ear from here to here is internal ear so this cochlea is the actual site of hearing why this semicircular canal is for balance, all right? So let me see this here. 
Externally, ear is used to, to receive and to transfer. To receive and to transfer. Receive and to transfer um, sound wave. Middle ear is to amplify it by the use of these three ear ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes, while the actual site of hearing is in the cochlea. All right, on one structure called organ of corti. Organ of corti. All right. So the answer there is cochlea, please. Spectacles with convex lens correct long sightedness by what? Now, let me help you here. Generally speaking, what convex lens does is to converge, what concave lens does is to what diverge. Right. Now, if somebody is having long sightedness, which is what you have down here we, we are putting the arrow there the um uh, let me see the 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 light rays or let me say the beam of light like is con is is um what's it called it converges behind the retina and that's because or let me say it, it converges behind the focal point or where it's meant to where the, the right place where it ought to be which is meant to be the uh, what's it called fovea centralis the yellow spot where you're going to have the sharpest image so it's it's it's, it's overly diverged that's why it is now converging here but for for it to be con for, for for it to be corrected you need a converging lens which is what you have in a convex lens so this is a converging lens which is a convex lens what we need to do we will, we will forcefully bring the the, the 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 image to focus here now so you can see because that's why i'm putting it here it's converging so it converges the light rays in front of the lens also in front of the retina where it's meant to be really so don't forget this is what you should remember convex lens generally converges when somebody is having long sightedness what happens is that the, the rays of light diverge more than normal they went to go and converge at the back of where they ought to be so you need a convergent lens to make sure it converges on time and that's why so you're going to use this converging lens be converging the light rays before they enter into the, the eyes. While somebody has having short sightedness is going to be opposite in, 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 that, in that case, the ray of light converges prematurely. So it's converging here. Let me, this is getting too rough. Yeah. Now it converges, can you see it converges here before the retina, before the actual place. So you need what? a divergent lens which is a concave lens to spread it out to spread you can see spreading it out spreading it out so you can they end up converging at the right place all right oh this is um helpful now just remember the way the lenses work and how it is appli applied here a seed or flowering plant can be can best be described as Okay, plumul and radicle are actually part of embryo, and they see it it's made up of embryo and endosperm or cotyledon. So the answer is C. So this and this are already part of this already. All right. So hope you understand. So it means that um, now a seed is formed from an ovule, but it, this is a developed ovule. It didn't say fertilized ovule. If it said fertilized ovule, that might make sense. All right, so the answer is embryo and endosperm. All right, so this endosperm is the, the of course, this is, look, let me show you. So all of this really is the embryo, even plus this is the embryo, plus the endosperm that forms the seed. All right, so this is um, endospermous seed, which is monocot. This is um, a non-endospermous seed, which is having cotyledon. But either way, remember that cotyledons and endosperm both do the same thing. They provide energy for the developing embryo, which are all of these structures there. All right. 
which of the following process removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Putrefication, that is when um, um, proteins are being extracted from the body of a dead animal. Uh, when it's decaying, and anytime something decays, carbon dioxide is released. Volcanic eruption, CO2 is released. Fuel burning, CO2 is released. So the answer is photosynthesis. When you look at this carbon cycle, you can see respiration from a plant, from animal, or uh, what's it called there? Uh, from factories, automobile and factory emissions. All of these are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But it's only photosynthesis that gets to re remove it from the atmosphere. It's a common question that is it's often said that which of the following increases amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can think about all of those activities of humans and which of the following reduces or removes. That's going to be photosynthesis. So the answer is B there. Which of the following cycles involves the process of precipitation and transpiration? That will be water cycle. Let me show you that the answer is this. Why is water cycle? Transpiration, so precipitation means when rain is actually falling down. So this is what you're seeing here. It falls as rain and snow and hail and fog. Now, transpiration is the like water vapor coming out from the body of plants. So you can see, I don't know if that's clear enough, or this is transpiration from trees and plants. So, so that happens through the stomata, like that, like that, like that, like that. That's transpiration, and all of that is going into the atmosphere to condense, all right? Then you can see evaporation happening from the water too. So all of this goes in the atmosphere. They are deposited, condensed, they are deposited, and they will come down as rain or snow or, or hail or fog. So you may want to pause the video here to just quickly look at the water cycle, all right? It's a reminder, it's a way we're trying to revise. What is the critical limiting factor for plants below the photic zone in an aquatic ecosystem? Photic zone simply means a zone whereby light gets to. So if this is sunlight, so sunlight will definitely get to the photic zone. So this area is going to be lightened, it's going to be brighter, and the organisms here will be able to photosynthesize easily because of the fact that light is available. But this is called a photic zone because those zones don't have enough lightning. Because as you move downwards, as you move from here downwards, it becomes darker. So it says availability of nutrient, availability of water, intensity of light, yes. What affects them is intensity of light is going to be lower as they move downwards that way. Which of the following instruments is used to estimate the number of plants in a habitat? Well, a putter is used to catch insects, all right, which I think I added a picture of that. This is a putter here. It's used, this, this is what it looks like. It's used to catch insects. So you probably, sometimes you can see this an insect there. So it sucks it in. So the insect is forced to go in like that into this place. And there's a net that covers the mouth hole, so the mouthpiece there, so that it won't end up sucking the insect into its own, own mouth. So there's a net that sees that. So you can see some insect. You already caught sometimes this same thing can be inserted. Let's say this a tree trunk like that, and some holes in the tree trunk like that. So when you insert it in, you can actually use to, to suck out insects. Then we have something called the answer to this question is actually quadrat, which is what you're having on the floor here, on the ground here, please. So this is a quadrat. So you can't each you can't plant species. Maybe this you're trying to count this one here, you just count that. And you use the formula of um, population density and all those things. Now, this is sweep net. This one is used to catch insects too. Like you just sweep it too like that. Like this person is doing down here. Sorry. So is so let's so insect around here will be will be swept in while that man is moving that um, um net over the vegetation there. So the answer to this question 
is quadrat. Let me let me make that clear. Quadrat, quadrat, quadrat. Which of the following statement is true about sandy soil? Has limited airspace, is light and easy to dig, drains slowly, is heavy and poorly aerated. Well, has limited space, is light and easy to dig. The answer is D. It's B, I mean to say, please. This D applies to clay soil, slowly drains, applies to clay soil, light and easy to dig. That is sandy soil. Has limited space, that's also clay soil. All right. Which of the following organisms is a primary consumer? Well, primary consumer will always be the first one to feed on producers in a food chain, which means this is a primary consumer. Sorry, that's this these are producers, 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 plants. So this in this case here, this is your primary consumer is the first to feed on the producer. This is another primary consumer to feed on the producer. Is another primary consumer feed on the producer. So while this next one will be secondary, okay, this one will be, this one will be in this regard. This will be secondary. This will be secondary. This is going to be secondary. All of that. So the one that feeds on this, the primary consumer. So here, one thing you should remember is that all primary consumers are always going to be herbivores that feed on grasses or that feed on plants. And from this, this is our answer here. Sheep here is. The herbivore that feeds on plants. So that's one thing common to those three. These, these, and this is that they are all herbivores. They feed on plants, right? Study the diagram of a food chain shown and use it to answer the question P to Q, Q to R, R to S, and S to T. The organism designated P. In a food chain above is normally sustained by the energy from the sun from sorry sustained by energy from the sunlight please that's photosynthesis which means that it's a producer like we just said in the previous question that the first guy here is always going to be a producer and producers have to make their own food by themselves all right All right, it says here, study the diagram of. Oh, okay. Which of the following statements describes the organism designated R? It is. That's going to be the secondary consumer. Because I told you that the P is the producer, the first organism fed on by primary consumer and the sec the one that's going to feed on that is the secondary consumer which is why d is the answer all right which of the following diseases is not hereditary which means can't be passed by genes that's going to be scabies scabies it is whereby you have some sort of rashes water producing rashes like that and you person get to scratch his his our body for so long and it can usually even spread around the body and all of that all right but albinism can be transferred hemophilia and color blindness can be transferred through the gene they are genetic i mean they are inheritable diseases immediate product of meiosis in flowering plants is the gametophytes yes that will end up producing yes that will end up producing gametes gametophytes are organisms sorry are structures that will produce the male gametes and the female gametes all right i don't know if this is yes so this is um i'm trying to say so this after meiosis, meiosis produces this is a female gametophyte, and this is the male gametophyte, which are both haploid. All right, at the end of the day, so that's just just know that gametophytes are plants, so are structures in a plant that produces gametes. All right, 
and the gamete is going to be it's going to be whether male gamete or female gamete. So in this case here, this is the male gamete producing gametophyte, and this is female gamete producing gametophyte. DNA in eukaryotic cells is contained in mm, the nucleus. That's why they are called eukaryotes. While prokaryotes, their own nucleus is actually found in this. Sorry, their DNA is found in the cytoplasm. So these are prokaryotes. This is the, so the DNA is going to be somewhere here, which is not shown in the diagram, but it's going to be there. Well, for these ones here called prokaryotes, their genetic material is what this coily thing. That's what it is, and it is not surrounded. It's just in the cytoplasm directly there. So we call that. Um, prokaryotes all right just that um you can be asked that i said that in other video that that the area in which this genetic material this this genetic material is found is called nucleoid all right but they don't have a nucleus please a woman who is heterozygous for the disease hemophilia marries a man who is hemophilic what percentage of the offspring will have the disease now at this point here let me okay let me still use the same space now when somebody's having women can actually let's say she a woman has xx chromosome as the sex cells and uh, when a woman has that i mean when when we say somebody is heterozygous it means that one of the two X chromosomes is one affected. Let me just put H there to denote that it is only this one that has the hemophilic um, traits on it. Now, this person, this kind of person is called a carrier. Why is this person called a carrier? Because the disease will not show on the person because this normal X chromosome will suppress the effect of the fault on this X, sec, second X chromosome. All right. Now, but for a woman to have those disease like manifest in her, the two X chromosome must have it some, such, such, as, such as this having the putting the H here and H here. That means the two X chromosome must be affected. While in male, the male can only be normal or have it like this. So this is the person, a man that has it because one X chromosome he has is affected already because most of these diseases are on X chromosomes, not all of them anyways. So which means that if he's, he has hemophilia on this X chromosome, then there's no other X chromosome to co correct it like it happened up here. So it means that he will have it, either a man has it or not. But a woman can either be a carrier, have the disease, or um, normal. Now, this is only for hemophilia, it's for all X-linked traits, so to say. So now, the question says, this one is heterozygous, it's going to be X, X, let me just put the H here, to denote that one of the X chromosome, that's, so she's heterozygous, she's a carrier. And a woman, a man who is hemophilic, which means he has it. So this is what we're going to do now. So I'm going to bring this, and this normal genetic cross is going to be X, X with H, H. Then like that, X, Y, with this H here again. Then the normal X, X, X with one H from the father. Then X, Y. So this is, okay, yeah, like that. Is that correct? I hope I didn't mix up anything there. Okay. So what that means is that this is a female. This is a male. This is a female. This is a male. So what it means is you're going to have... So this person here, she's going to be hemophilic. That is 25%. This guy is going to also be hemophilic. That's another 25%. This one is going to be a carrier. This is normal. This person is, is normal. All right, so 50% is what we have from both of them. So the answer is going to be C. 
all right so you need to remember the fact that for a woman to have it the two x chromosome must be affected that's why this third child which is a female doesn't have the disease because she's just a carrier because only one of the x chromosome is um, affected and please bear this in mind a father will give sex or x linked trait i mean to say to his daughter while the mother will give the x linked trait to his sorry to her son all right father to daughter mother to son all right cytokinesis of mitosis is a process that ensures that each daughter cells get necessary organelles there is distribution of, of a complete set of chromosome in each daughter cell daughter cells in your genetic material one out organelles are excluded from daughter cells well let me show you this before we so what it does is that it makes sure that this is cytokinesis which means the splitting of the cytoplasm actually like that like that and from what you've seen on the screen you should be able to know that the answer is going to be um um distribution of a complete set of genes to each daughter cell all right so all these ones the genes will go here the other one will go there so that they can actually be separated out all right that's cytokinesis after tel 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 sorry, after telophase so telophase has actually moved the chromosomes the chromosomes have arrived at the opposite poles of the cell and now the um, cell membrane and cytoplasm need to cleave out but this what you are seeing here is called this is um cleavage furrow this one is cleavage furrow it's only seen in plant sorry animal cell in plant cell they won't the plant cell will not um cleave like this let's say this is a plant that wants to divide it's not going to cut that way it's going to just form something called cell plate and this one will become another cell this one become another cell that's their own kind of cytokinesis all right because of the rigid cell wall they have an animal which is active during the day is called diurnal while those are active at night are called nocturnal so these are examples so these are nocturnal animals they like the dark they come out at night or they stay in the dark all right and we, the common one you can think about in our homes would be cockroaches cockroaches like to stay in the dark so you see them in the dark parts of the cupboard and none of that so that's nocturnal means staying in the dark or loving darkness while um diurnal means day or loving the day so they are active also in the day all right this bath here will be here bath is nocturnal also now the diagram to answer the question the diagram shows the organisms are um oviparous please now oviparous means they lay eggs which is this viviparous means organisms that give birth to their young ones alive now over viviparous is this let me explain this quickly please oviparous means they lay eggs for example now this one will lay the egg and go their way so these eggs are being laid by the female and the male is pouring sperm on them that's external fertilization now but for ovoviviparous the egg is fertilized in the body of the female and stays there till almost hatching so when it's time for this to hatch the mother gives lays this egg and it hatches immediately sometimes it starts hatching from the body of the mother example could be viper i think i've heard about the fact that sometimes the, 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 the they can actually even eat out the body of the mother if she doesn't get to, to know on time or get to do what's necessary on time so oviparous oviparous means um having a fertilized egg retained in the body of the mother so maturity but viviparous means as a matter of fact you don't even have egg really you have a live child 
a live organism that stays in the body of the mother, not as egg, and is given back to as a living organism, not as an egg at all. Oh, that is clear. Use the diagram to also answer this. The breeding posture illustrating diagram is known as courtship display. Yes, they're actually having courtship. Well, the courtship is funny because courtship here is going to lead to reproduction. So they're going to do this about, for about three days, really. And the, the female will be laying the egg and the sperm, the male will be pouring sperm on it simultaneously. An accurate identification of a rapist can be carried out by conducting DNA analysis. I think I said it in another video. Blood test can it's not reliable enough. Other people can have the same blood cell like that person, blood group, I mean to say. But DNA is yours. You're, you have your own DNA. All right. Now, a boy who is fond of swimming in a pond finds himself passing urine with traces of blood. He is likely to have contracted a disease called schistosomiasis. Now, hear this. The reason why this was put there is because that's how he got it in the first place. And you can see from the diagram I put here, if you, you probably need to pause, pause the video to see what happens here. Now, be careful. Um, schistosoma affects two places. Affects the liver and affects the bladder. In the case of this boy, the one I have here is the one that's affecting the liver. You can see, uh, where is that again? I'm trying to see. Uh, okay. Yes, here. The one, I can't remember the name. There are two different species of schistosoma. One goes to stay in the liver. The other one goes to stay in the bladder. The one that goes to stay in the bladder cause some inflammation. They both cause issues where they stay anyways. So this boy, in his own case, it affected his bladder. That species affected his bladder and led to a hematuria, which means blood in his urine, basically. So that is um, the... The answer is kistosomiasis, which is caused from a, a, um, a pathogen called, or let me see, yes, a pathogen called schizosoma, schizosoma, all right. The flippers of a whale and the fins of a fish are example of convergent evolution, which I told you before that when this fin and this flipper perform the same function because they both live in the same environment, which is water. When different structures are performing the same function, that's convergent, convergent evolution. The yellowish fluid, so the yellowish colored liquid component of blood that normally holds the blood cells in suspension is the Plasma. All right, now I'm going to have to say something quickly here. This is the plasma there. It is separated out like this. You're having plasma up here, uh, leukocytes and platelets like this, and erythrocytes because it has been centrifuged already. Like it wasn't like this before. The whole thing is going to be the same red, but because you've centrifuged it and you've added something called anticoagulant, so it's not going to clot and separate out this way. Now, bear this in mind. Serum and plasma almost the same. I guess that's why this was added to, to confuse students that are not so sure. Serum is almost the same thing as plasma, only for the fact that it does not have fibrinogen. That's one major difference. Let me write that again, please. Fibrinogen. Fibrinogen. Gene. So plasma has fibrinogen, but in serum, what you have is fibrin. It has been converted to fibrin because serum comes out from um, when the blood is outside the blood vessel. For example, you have a cut now, 
and your blood oozes out a little. When your blood is done clotting, you're gonna see one little whitish, or let me say transparent kind of fluid on that blood clot, and that is serum. And that serum does not have fibrin in it. It has been converted to fibrin. So it does not have fibrinogen to in it. It has been converted to fibrin, which is very essential for blood clotting, right? So serum is meant to be seen in like blood clotting, so to say. While plasma is still within the blood, so to say. The function of peace in plant is to The answer is actually B. The answer there is, is, is quite very, very nice. Pith or medulla is a tissue in stem or vascular plants. Not only that, anyways, composed of soft, spongy parenchyma cells which store and transport nutrients throughout the body of the plant. That is what I was trying to say. That's pith there. So it transports nutrients and other substances within the plant, all the structures, also other nutrients like that. So you can pause the video to look at that. You can see why I did here. This red part here, let me zoom that some more. This is peace. This space to is peace. That's more obvious in the stem than the root, but that's the peace in there. Sorry, this is not the pith place here. There's no pith here. It's in the stem, I mean to say, please. In the stem. So this red one is xylem. That was a mistake, please. So this is the pith up here, please. A pollutant that is mostly associated with acid, acid rain is, uh, okay, acid rain is caused by nitrogen oxide, is caused by sulfuric, so it's sulfur oxide too, like that. So one of these nitrogen oxide, all right. So this will lead to nitric, um, nitric acid, and this will lead to sulfuric acid, which will be present in the rain. All right. So A is the answer. That's one of the components of pollutant that leads to acidic rain. What is the function of contractor vacuum? What's the function of contractor vacuum in paramecium? Get rid of excess water. Yes. And um, remove waste product, just like the same thing it does here. To get rid of water and maybe some ammonia and all of those. Just remember that um, this contractor vacuum works like kidney in higher plants or in higher animal, I mean to say. An organism which exhibits extracellular digestion is fungi, and fungi here, or fungi as some call it, is, example of fungi here is rhizopus. All right. So you can see this rhizopus growing on bread. So it's going to ex externally secrete digestive juice that's a juice digestive enzymes yeah so to say onto this bread so it's going to end up digesting this bread gradually till it's done digesting the whole thing all right of course this spore will also land here and we love to form all the new rhizopause and the digestion continues so it secretes externally to digest its food that's fungi basically How many days is used for incubation of an egg to release chick? Three weeks, which is 21 days. Three weeks, that's 21 days. The four classes of Nidaria include the following except Tubularia. Tubularia is actually one of the classes of um, Worms, I think, um, round worms. All right. Well, these ones here are actually examples, of classes of Nidaria. So the answer here is B. So it's A. I mean to say. So these are examples. These are the uh, Hydrozoa, which is Hydra, Cobozoa, uh, Schifozoa, 
and the anthos right? these are different categories of nidarians this nidaria is the same thing as cholenterates or cholenterata please just that nidaria is more recent now but we used to call them cholenterata or cholenterates before so to be like as it's actually worms all right and that is not same here now what will happen if solution y is more concentrated than solution x y than x y than x of course we know that means that fluid will move out from x to y because if y is more than x in concentration that means why we always suck things to itself. So it says that means level will rise in X, Y will fall. No, it's meant to be that level of Y will rise and X will fall. Yes, because what is going to move from X to Y. So this is going to drop or this is going to increase as I D. Physiological adaptation to very dry conditions in animal demonstrates dry or hot. That will demonstrate estivation, please. Estivation in, in animals. You know, say the animal is xeromorphism is talking about, uh, isn't that about zero fight and all of those? All right, but that's in plants. But estivation is what is used to overcome dryness, dry drought, I mean drought and all of that, desert condition or dry season for a long period of time. While hibernation is used to them to overcome, to stay in active. Both of them, hibernation and estivation, are both uh, places whereby organism becomes inactive for a period of time. So estivation is going to be inactive during hot weather, while hibernation is during extremely cold weather. You might want to pause the video here. Yes. So, hibernation is majorly done by endoderms. En endotherms, I mean to say. Endotherms means warm-blooded, means homeothermic animals. So, you can read what happens here. My estivation is done by ectotherms or parkilothermic or cold-blooded. And they use that to, to overcome cold. Um, uh, sorry. Estimation is used to overcome hot weather conditions. So you might want to pause the video here to see everything is self-explanatory. You can also see I added another process called brumation. The hormones secreted by pancreas serves to uh, lower blood sugar level. Okay, well, it's not only to, that's the answer here, but it's not only to lower it, it means to maintain it. Because, what do I mean? It means to maintain it. Let's say, that, for example, let me put this as A. You have eaten food and your blood glucose level or sugar level has risen. That will send a stink signal to the pancreas to do what? To, to release insulin. What will insulin do? So then we do two major things. We cause the excess sugar, which is glucose, to be stored as glycogen. That's what you're saying here. Glucose to glycogen is being stored. All right. Now, not only that, second, it's going to make sure that your body cells accept and take in more glucose. And what would that lead to? It will lead to bringing your glucose level low which is normal in this regard all right because you don't want it to be too high that's why people have diabetes mellitus have consistent high level of glucose because there's nothing to help them bring it down which is what is doing that so they don't have insulin so their glucose level is perpetually high or sugar level means the same thing it's perpetually high all right so it has stored converted glucose to glycogen stored in the liver and stored in the muscle tell and helps muscle cells sorry body cells to pick up more glucose on the other hand let's see what happens you have a uh, low sugar level like it's now too low which is not good also this will send a signal to pancreas to do what to release glucagon what will glucagon do 
number one or which is major is going to do is do what make sure that it breaks down what was stored before but not at once gradually the glycogen that was stored before is going to glucose a little and release it into blood for energy to be used for cells to perform all right so it releases that into the blood all right to raise the blood glucose level again so okay blood circulation in a mammal is said to be double because the it passes twice through the heart in a complete circle yes that is the answer blood passes through the heart twice number one when it goes to the lungs from lungs back to the heart that's pulmonary circulation one then from the heart it goes out like that goes around the body come back to the heart that's true that's systemic so it passes through the heart twice on the comp in a complete circulation so that's what it means all right example of animals with mammary gland include the following except well hen which are birds don't have mammary glands the hygrometer is used for measuring what hygrometer is used for measuring relative humidity and it looks like this so it measures how moist or how dry the atmosphere is because relative humidity means how dry or how moist the environment is basically mineral salts can be absorbed in the root by hmm, diffusion and active transports if this were to be the soil is your plant like that these are the roots now uh, let's see this is sodium in the soil sodium in the soil um okay, let's say calcium in the soil let's magnesium like that just like that now these are ions if the amount of sodium here is 10 and the amount of sodium here is 20 because it is higher in the soil let's say in the plant is going to move in by diffusion but let's say for magnesium it is let's say we have we have 10 magnesium in the plant we have five in the soil which is also small which is small but the the law is that it doesn't mean that magnesium will move from the plant into the soil no even if it is just one magnesium molecule in the soil it must go into the plant's body by a process called active transport which means you are you are taking uh, magnesium from where it is just five to where it is ten and that's what we need energy that's why we call it active transport active transport means transferring of of molecules from area of lower concentration to higher concentration by the use of energy so the answer is c which is an animal without red blood cells the answer is earthworm earthworm has um has no red blood cells but the blood it has appears red because it has hemoglobin in it please because i know you probably wonder like, I, that isn't the blood red it's red because of presence of hemoglobin but it doesn't have red blood cells don't forget that red blood cells too appears red because of hemoglobin in it too all right the temporary union of two organisms and the exchange of nuclear element is called conjugation actually conjugation it's not a full kind of but at least it's used in lower organisms to carry out their reproduction sexual reproduction i mean to say a plant tissue that carries water and mineral salts tissue and mineral salts sorry water and mineral salts is going to be xylem this is going to be xylem please sorry for that disruption
So this is xylem here. Taking water and mineral salts that has dissolved in the soil like that around the body of the plant. Why phlegm is one that transports food. Now let me say it here, please. At the end of photosynthesis, what you form is glucose. Now, glucose is then transported as sucrose. That means it's going to be converted to sucrose. And sucrose is then stored as starch. So you should know that in the plant, we form glucose, transport it as sucrose, store it as starch. This is very important, please. This is very, very important. So, uh, so that's why you are seeing translocation of sucrose, which is sugar. All right. Which of the following relationship involves only one organism? Only one organism. Okay, that would be saprophytism, which means that it's just one organism that causes things to decay, like bacteria and fungi. The other organism is already dead, so it just stays on it and causes it to decay and obtain its food from it as it's decaying. But commensalism, all of these other ones involve um, two or more or two organisms. Symbiosis is actually just two organisms living together, which so it means example of symbiosis is commensalism and parasitism. So the answer is saprophytism, which is only one that is only one organism is doing the whole thing there. Which part provides food for the developing cheek? Well, developing cheek should be starting, that should be two. So what would it be? provide energy for it or food for it? It's gonna be four, which is albumen, and three, which is yolk. That's three and um, four. That's option C. The process in which plant uses light to synthesize nutrients from carbon dioxide and water, that's very straightforward, is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Cold blooded animals are referred to as pyrophilothermic, means that their body temperature is dependent on their environment. Well, um, uh, Homo, homeothermic, that's not here anyways, means that they can actually, look. Okay, this looks like homeothermic, it's meant to be homeothermic, like homeostatic kind of thing like that. Those ones are called warm-blooded, so to say. All right. The vessel carrying oxygenated blood to the tissues is... Oh, okay. Now... That will be the aorta. Now, let me say why I said, picked this. Why, why didn't I pick arteries? The blood vessel that leaves the heart is the aorta carrying oxygenated blood. But there's a particular type of artery called pulmonary artery which carries the oxygenated blood. So if you just choose artery, you've missed it because this particular one is, I mean, if you see arteries, you've mentioned the one that also carries the oxygenated blood, which is not what we want to do. But in the case of um, aorta, that's specifically carrying um, um, oxygenated blood out of the left ventricle. That's why we picked that there, all right? Which of the following is a mixed gland? Okay, now when we say mixed gland, it means in this context, it actually means it has two types of glands in it that produces two, two types of solutions or two types of secretions, so to say. And the answer is the pancreas. Why is it having mixed gland? Number one, it can actually secrete hormones. It can secrete hormones. And it can also secrete enzymes. So we call this the digestive function of the uh, pancreas. And we call this the endocrine function of the pancreas. So that's, that's what it does. It secretes hormones. 
glucagon, um, insulin, somatostatin, and all of that, while it secretes enzymes like pancreatic lipase, trypsin, okay, trypsin is also a hormone, and uh, I mean, it secretes a number of, of enzymes, really. Now, wait, did I say trypsin is a hormone? It's also an enzyme, all right? So all of this is what it does, really, that makes it to secrete, or that we say it has mixed um, um, glands, so to say. So this is the pancreas that is always found in the loop of the duodenum. When you see the duodenum like that, like I'm showing it here, it here now, this is a loop of the duodenum. In between that loop, you always have that um, pancreas there. Well, nobody will really ask you to draw any diagram in UTME, but you need the understanding of a lot of things, really. All right, so if you are eloquent with diagrams, it's going to be help you solve some questions automatically all right a group of organisms of the same species living together in a particular area is described as i think we've answered a question like that earlier on a population that was what i think that should be like first question or second question where, where i showed you different organisms living together they can interbreed so i mean the same org organisms living together they can interbreed within themselves and they're the same species that forms a population why a community means two or more populations in a place, basically, like having a population of goats, population of rats, population of different organisms forms a community, then alongside with their um, environment, then leads to formation of an ecosystem. Tika disease is related with the crop ground knot, actually. So it's found in a crop called ground knot. Of course, we know the normal granules that we eat, and it looks, I'm not sure, wow, I thought I had it, um, a diagram on that, all right, sorry, but it's actually granules, like normal granules, it's going to cause some sort of um, spots on the granules, and at the end of the day, it's going to um, end up affecting photosynthesis and other processes, end up killing the granules earlier than it should. Uh, at which stage in this life cycle can a man be infected? All right, this is the life cycle of um, tapeworm, right? So this is the adult form here, number six. Then this is the proglotid, mature one with, um, well, of course, this one is in the, the, this this number one is in the human, already in the human, a mature is going to fertilize. Each, each of the segments has some, um, the male and has ovary and testes. So this is what we are talking about here. This number two there. It has well, ovary and testes. So it's going to chop off from the, the matured tapeworm. So that's going to go out with the person's fecal matter. And that's if that fecal matter goes in the bush and um, it changes to the lava form. And that lava form is called bladder worm. At that point, at that point, uh, no, let me say so. The, let me before I go for that. So this is in the bush, the egg in in, in the form of a cyst, so to say. Now, if um, let's say a grazing animal like the cow comes here, or the cattle comes here to eat those grass, it's going to take in this egg, which is going to develop to form bladder, which is form, which is form, and this one goes in to the muscles of the um cattle or i mean of the of the cow that's eaten it or the bull whether male or female now if humans then buys these or get to eat this beef then that's how you're going to that's going to move into the body of humans so it is from number four that's when humans become infected bladder worm that's what is in the beef all right then from here to, to from here to here is in humans. The total salt content in blood is about. Well, I don't know if I've shown you a uh, maybe that much later or, or a diagram of sorry, I talking about uh, normal saline. Why is it that we don't just give ordinary water to people when we are trying to do infusion of fluid. Why is that it's always normal saline that has some salt in it? 
there you see that there's something like 0.9% of sodium in there. So we can say the answer is D, which is 0.85 to 0.9% of salt is what you have in the normal saline. All right. And that's because that's what is also in the blood. So it won't be too much, it won't be too less. The role of scolex in tapeworm is to um, for attachment to the host. Now, that is not the only thing the scolex does really. It's just because of the fact that that's what is in this option here. So let me show you what the scolex looks like. Now, this entire structure here, you can see that there forms the scolex. And on that scolex, you have hooks really for attachment. You have suckers like that to suck nutrients from the host. Now, it's not all tapeworms that have uh, hooks. This is tenia saginata, which is found in beef. Why we have another one called tenia sodium found in pork? Those ones are, don't have that. Those ones don't have hooks, but they equally have scolex and uh, what's it called um, suckers, as it were. Right. So you need to know that difference. So basically, um, because of the presence of hook, so we can say the scolex is for attachment. All right. Which of the following animals is cold-blooded? Which means it's a um, reptile. The answer is going to be lizard. How? Because it also comes out to bask. I think I did mention that sometimes ago that that um, they come out in the morning to to get gain heat because their temperature is dependent on the environment. So snakes and all of those will come out to where the sun is to gain some heat. So here, the example here is um, a lizard, cat, whale. Are mammals, apes, birds are also uh, warm blooded, like the mammals there. The energy released by one gram of glucose is okay, that will be four gram, four kilocalorie, please. Now, I want you to remember this, please that one gram of fat produces nine kilocalorie, so to say. Well, um, uh, protein and glucose both release four kilocalories. All right. The function of the trichocyst in paramecium is for uh, for defense. So let me show you what trichocyst looks like. Now, if I zoom this in like that these structures those tiny bubbles so to say represent trichocyst like that so you can see where this is pointing to one of those things that look like like bead like that so it releases this to it contains some sort of chemicals which can actually scare off um predators and all of that all right so it's for defense all right Man can contact tapeworm through ingestion of uncooked meat from fish, from breathing, from through contact. Well, I think I'm going to work with ingestion of uncooked or improperly cooked meat. All right. Even though you can still get some in fish, I think it's more to meat. Yes. Ingesting or cooked or improperly cooked meat. All right. An example of radially symmetry cal organism is now radially symmetric organism means an organism that when you derive from the center, each of the segments have some similarities, so to say. And in this case, um, those kind of organisms are the ones that uh, most times are um, they don't have. Um, they don't have a really a head or a tail, so to say. So looking at this here, um, this uh, sea anemones that has radial symmetry. So this is a segment, which is going to look like this segment, look like this segment, like that, like that. Well, bilateral symmetry means when you split it into two, this half and this other half 
will look alike. And this one means asymmetry, which means this is um, uh, uh, porifera, like sponges. Those ones can't be splitted at all, really. So from what we have here, radial symmetry can be seen in um, hydra. So we're going to pick hydra. Other ones can be splitted into so they can, um, A, C, and um, D can exhibit bilateral symmetry. But it's only hydra here that can actually exhibit Realist, radial symmetry. All right. Maltose is a combination of glucose and glucose. Sucrose is actually a combination of glucose plus fructose. All right. Why lactose is, well, that's not here. Lactose is going to be a combination of glucose plus galactose, so to say. All right. So the above, all of these are disaccharides. This, uh, disaccharide made up of two glucose that's for maltose for sucrose for one glucose glucose and one fructose then um, galactose is a monosaccharide also all right so this is disaccharide disaccharide and disaccharide all right the vitamin which is important in formation of retina is retina is um the part of the eyes that contains rods and cones, which helps in vision. And if you don't have one of those ones, you might end up having some sort of night blindness. And that vitamin that is responsible, essential for retinal formation or pigment in the retina, which is rods and cones, is actually vitamin A, which we call retinol. Retinol, retinol. All right. So the answer is A. In the eggs of a bird, the embryo is located within the uh, yolk. Yes. So this is the embryo we formed here. Actually, let me put an E. -E let's see. So the embryo will be formed within the yolk, like as you see it here. It's here. So this embryo will be formed within the yolk. All right. The greatest amount of energy will be obtained by oxidation of 100 kilogram of what? So you know that I told you that fat has the highest energy or calorie in it, followed by protein and carbohydrates. So in this case here, we will look at which of these represents a fatty substance, and that's going to be water. All right, that's what it means. It's going to be water. Now, accessory material in a chicken egg include the following except accessory means the ones that will help the embryo or the the, 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 the yes the embryo to grow so those are the accessory but which of this is not an accessory so album is an accessory shell membrane is an accessory shell itself but the one that is not an accessory here is the germinal disc Solon bleeding gum are another common sign of which vitamin? When somebody has that kind of thing, it's called scurvy. Scurvy, S U R V Y, scurvy. And that is due to absence of vitamin C, which we get that from fruit, orange, and all of that. So, scurvy is what was bleeding of the gum and all of that like you have it here all right of course please this um scurvy means your mouth is clean and everything is normal not as and it's still bleeding when you're trying to brush not that probably you hit your mouth on something and your mouth bleed that doesn't mean you have scurvy right double fertilization is a unique features of uh angiosperm angiosperm actually have exhibits double fertilization let me explain that to you quickly now look at this. This is the sperm cells. Let me see sperm cell A and sperm cell B coming from the pollen grid. Now you see that sperm cell A goes to the egg cell in the ovule, all right, to form what? Zygote. While the second sperm cell goes on to meet with this polar nuclei to form what? Endosperm. So you can see it here one two three all right 
So this one is the second sperm cell from the uh, uh, spolin green, while this first um, sperm cell is also from the spolin green, fertilizing the, the, the egg cell of the ovule to form a zygote. While this was going to form the endosperm, and endosperm is what's going to feed the embryo when it's going to develop. Right. The gland that's, that's present close to the trachea. So this is the trachea is somewhere here that's close to the trachea. Well, that's going to be the thyroid gland. Let me show you that in a moment. Here we are. So this is the trachea there, and this is the thyroid gland close to it indeed, right? The distinguishing feature of mammals is the possession of, well, two major things, which is hair and mammary gland. Those are the distinguishing features of mammals, hair and mammary gland. So what I did here is to um, show us examples, I mean, other characteristics of mammals. So you might want to pause the video here to see other characteristics they have, all right? Example of micronutrients include the following except. Micronutrients include the following except. Okay. Well, all vitamins, this is vitamin B7, biotin. So all of these are actually uh, micronutrients except for carbon. Carbon is a major part of uh, all organisms organically. Like every part of us is made up of protein has carbon in it, carbohydrate has carbon in it, fats has carbon in it. So it's a major thing. So it says which of these, all of these, like all of the following are micronutrients except for carbon. Um, etiolation is caused by the influence of what um, that's going to be um, light. So basically, it's because of absence of light, which, uh, or let's say total or little light. So this will cause the plant to underdevelop. It's going to form tiny, small leaves. The stem will not be all that strong because it has been deprived of light. And that is the... Botanin is also known as what? Well, botanin has to be study of plants. And when you hear the word phyto, it has to be plants, so you can say it's phytology. I, that's like an old thing, really, so it's going to be phytology. Name of the blood cells in which nucleus is absent. Well, we have two of them. That nucleus is absent, the red blood cells and the platelets which makes B our answer. The red blood cells and the platelets are uh, blood cells without um, nucleus, all right? The damage to ozone layer is caused by a group of compounds called chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs. The answer is C. Chlorofluorocarbons are from different things, propellant, aerosols, and all that. They are released in the atmosphere and they end up creating holes in the atmosphere, in the, the ozone, and that causes heat to pass through and all of that. All right. Long neck in giraffe is used to illustrate the theory of um, use and disuse by Lamarck. Now, he believes that the more you use a part of your body as an organism, the more it becomes better, which is good, which is true. However, that's why some of us have our right hand is more powerful than our left hand because we use the right hand more, right? However, it, the, the error he made was that he felt this can be passed on to the next generation, which is wrong because you can only transmit um, uh, genetic, genetic, genetically controlled characters. It's like there's a gene controlling it, that's why you can pass it on. But this one just happened because of circumstances. They kept stretching their neck to be able to reach um, the branches of the tree to eat. So according to him, so this gave it to its children like that, like that, the gene. That's uh, not really correct, but it explains the theory of use and disuse by Jean 
baptize lamaka